Thank you, Mark. Uh, good morning, everyone, once again. Good morning. Thank you for attending our April Shosti Hoyo and also our Hanumaki service celebrating the birthday of Shakyamuni Buddha. And I want to thank everybody for participating in today's service. I love the way when uh, Mark read off the representatives and Slayer's Buddhist Temple, everybody kind of looked at each other. <laughs> you go, go, you go, go, you go. So thank you, Neil, for coming up. Uh, this morning, I'm really honored to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Scott Mitchell. Uh, over the weekend, we've been able to spend some time together and get to know each other on a different level because I'm one of the board of trustees, uh, members of the Institute of Buddhist Studies. And Dr. Mitchell is the dean of the Institute of Buddhist Studies. And so our interaction has been as trustee and as dean. Um, but this weekend, we're able to sit down, have meals, and talk, and really get to know each other on a, on a different level. I really enjoy the time that we've had together this weekend. And yesterday, Dr. Mitchell had a wonderful seminar to talk about his book, The Making of American Buddhism. And I think all of us who attended learned something and uh, enjoyed the seminar with Dr. Mitchell. So Dr. Mitchell, as I mentioned, is the Dean of Students at the Institute of Book Studies. But also, in July, he will be the new president of the Institute of Buddhist Studies. So he's moving up the ladder. I think this is as far as he can go in the Institute of Buddhist Studies as president. Um, Dr. Mitchell has taught classes at the Institute of Buddhist Studies for many years, including Buddhism in the West, uh, Buddhism in the film, the history of Shin Buddhism, and critical race theory of American Buddhism. He received his uh, bachelor's degree from the San Francisco State University, his master's degree from the Institute of Buddhist Studies and the Graduate Theological Union, and his doctorate from the Graduate Theological Union. So I am so pleased to introduce to all of you our guest speaker and my new friend, Dr. Scott Mitchell. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Neil. Just to think about 
great historical figures like the historical Buddha or Shinran, but also the people in our lives who came before us. Uh, the people and the causes and conditions that have brought us here today. One of the ways that I first encountered Shin Buddhism was actually through the Institute of Buddha Studies. Uh, when I started studying at IBS, um, we didn't have the offices in Berkeley. Uh, the offices were in Mountain View, and uh, uh, Jane was working there. I remember meeting her <laughs> many, many years ago uh, when I first started studying at IBS. And uh, also when I first started studying at IBS, there were about three students. There were not that many students at all. Uh, today we have uh, maybe 50, 60 students. So it's been uh, lovely to see the institute grow over the years. But really what I, what I wanted to say is that of those students that were there, many of them became very good Dharma friends, such as uh, Reverend Harry Bridge, who's currently the minister at uh, Open Buddha Temple. Reverend Harry and I have been friends for 25 odd years now. He performed my, my wedding for us. Um, and we connected, I think, mostly uh, at the time when I first started studying at IBS because we both really liked heavy metal music. <laughs> and the movie Tron. Have you ever seen Tron? <coughs> uh, at least one. <laughs> um, so, uh, over the years, Harry and I have had a, a very good friendship, and he's become one of those people that I consider a true Dharma friend, um, somebody who's helped me understand Joe and Shinjo on a deeper level. And so I think it's important to reflect on and remember our ancestors, remember our teachers. But I also know that there are a lot of other people in our lives who've influenced us. And it's this vast and complicated web of interconnections that make today possible. So services like these, to me, are great opportunities to reflect on all the people who came before us, who helped us uh, become who we are and bring us here today together. So I want to go back to that passage I read to begin with uh, at the beginning of this talk. Um, extremely difficult is it to encounter an age in which a Buddha appears and difficult indeed for a person to realize the wisdom of Shinji. This is uh, from uh, Shinran's Jodo Shinshu. Um, this idea uh, of difficulty might be more familiar because it's actually part of the three treasures that we often read in uh, temple. But the, the version that's in that big purple book um, is, uh, or one of the versions anyways, hard is to be born in human life, now we are living it. Difficult is it to hear the Dharma, now we are hearing it. Um, I, I often come back to this passage, and um, you know, it's sort of like reading a book that you've read before, over and over again. The book is the same, but you change over time. So um, I remember the first time that I heard this, this phrase, hard as it to be born in human life. And this particular way of phrasing it, when I first came across it, I took it sort of literally. I took it literally in a Buddhist uh, sort of cosmological sense, where it said that we're, there are six realms of rebirth, and we're lucky, we're very fortunate to be born as humans, uh, because there's other ways in which we could, be, uh, we could come to this life. Uh, which reminds me of a thing, but the other day my, my wife was reading the news and she um, uh, came across an article that said that for every single person on the planet, there's something like two million ants. <laughs> way more bugs in the world than there are people. It's way more likely that would come back um, to be born as an insect or an animal than it is to be a human. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a silly thing to say, but when I first read this this uh, this, this phrase that hard is it to be born in a human life, that's that's sort of how I took it. It's a rare and precious opportunity that we have to be born as humans in order to um, to come into contact with the Dharma. But over time, the, the as I've come back to this phrase uh, over and over again, I, I read it differently. Not only do I think that there's um, this sense of, 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 of rarity or preciousness in being born a human, but I come back to this phrasing of hard is it to be born in a human life and difficult is it to hear the Dharma. That life is hard and things are difficult and perhaps I feel this way more now over the last few years when things have been kind of hard <laughs> over the last few years with um, you know, wildfires here in California and the drought and of course COVID. Hard as it to be born in human life. <clears throat> uh, and I bring this up not, not just to sort of bum everybody out, 
But I, I want to bring it up because it, it often reminds me of, you know, part of the, the difficulty of hearing the Dharma is also its preciousness, its rarity. Um, and it reminds me of a very well-known parable in the Dodo tradition of the two rivers of the light pass. And I assume that most of us have heard this parable before, but I'm not going to go. Um, the story is that there's a traveler, and he's lost in the wilderness, and he's being pursued by wild animals and thieves and robbers, and he comes upon a river. <clears throat> it's actually two rivers. One river is made of water, but the water are rapids, and there are uh, churning, turbulent waves that are splashing over uh, the, the banks of the river. And the other river is a river of fire, flames everywhere threatening to sweep the traveler off the path and into, uh, into his death. But between these two rivers is a narrow white path. Probably, in, in my imagining, it's just a few inches wide, a kind of path you have to keep one foot in front of the other to, to cross it. And of course, the waves and the flames are on either side of this path, making, uh, making the, the path very difficult and, and perilous. So the traveler is, is stuck because he doesn't feel safe crossing the path, but he can hear the wild animals and all the bad guys behind him threatening to kill him. So what can he do? But it's at that moment that he hears from across the river a voice, and the voice says, trust me. Take the path. Come toward me. Come forward. You will be safe, and you will make it to the other shore. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, of course, but that's the nice thing about parables is you can paraphrase them and <coughs> come back to them time and again and learn these new lessons. This parable, to me, is the truth of our lives. This is what our lives are really all about. This is why it's difficult to be born in human life and to hear the Dharma, because here we are, beset by wild animals and horrible things and pandemics and wildfires. <coughs> and then we find ourselves in situations where we have to make impossible choices. We can stay where we are, or we can move forward. How do we make these difficult decisions? But in that moment, that's when you hear the voice calling to you. The voice is telling you that it's going to be okay. Come, come with me. You'll be fine. All you have to do is put one in front of the other and take the next step. Make the next right choice. Cross the river. This to me is the difficult teaching. Hard is it to be born in a human life and difficult is it hear this teaching. It's difficult to hear the Dharma sometimes because it's a hard lesson. The Dharma is rare, like Shunan says. To hear the Dharma is among all things most difficult. Especially on this side of the river, it's difficult to hear that you need to take that step and cross it. It's difficult to have faith that not just that you need to entrust the voice, but you also have to take the step. You also have to move. It's not just that we're entrusting ourselves to this voice from across the river. We are also having to take that choice and make that next step. We have to make it happen. <clears throat> so um, what's any of this have to do with Hanamatsuri? <laughs> I bet you're wondering. Um, from my perspective, all of the people who came before us, all of the ancestors who literally built the building that we are in right now, all of the, the folks who have given Dharma talks from here before, all the ministers, all the YBA folks who are making much for us, all of the people who have come before us, they are actually the voice on the other side of the river telling us that we're going to be okay. All you have to do to make it across the path is just put one foot in front of the other and it takes the next right step. And that, to me, is the important thing about services here in the temple. Services are an opportunity for us to hear the Dharma. But when we do special services like these today, we're reminded of the folks who came before us, the folks who first shared the Dharma with us. And that gives us an opportunity to remember all of the people, all of our ancestors, all of the causes and conditions that brought us here, that make our lives possible. This is the opportunity that we have today to remember the people who created the causes and conditions for us to be here, right now, in, in this present moment. Without the hard work and actions of those who came before us, none of this is possible, and we would not be able to hear the Dharma and share it together. Just like all the people who came before us who created the causes and conditions for us to be here today, 
every single one of us in this room, we are creating causes and conditions for future generations. We are creating the world that our children will inherit, that our children's children will inherit. We are making choices today that are going to affect people in the future in ways we probably can't even imagine. So that's part of the great responsibility of feeling grateful, to have gratitude, to remember all the people who came before us. But then I think the next step is to not just be grateful for the past, but to take responsibility for what we are doing in the present and creating the future. We need to remember those who came before us and what they did, their sacrifices, all of their hard work, the work that they did to create this Sangha, to create this community and the causes and conditions that bring us here. And then we need to take that energy with a sense of gratitude and turn to the future, knowing that what we do now in the present will create the future. That's the hard part. We find ourselves in the present moment, remembering the past, and then looking to the future. This, to me, is the Dharma difficulty here. We encounter the teachings, we remember the people who came before us, and then we take that energy into the future. We use it as inspiration for how we're going to move forward, taking the next step on the narrow white path, no matter how difficult, no matter how hard, because we must move forward. We must continue to create the causes and the conditions for the Dharma to continually spread for future generations to be supported and buoyed by our actions here in the present. This, to me, is indeed a rare and precious teaching. So, once again, Please join me in Extremely difficult is it to encounter an age in which a Buddha appears, and difficult indeed for a person to realize the wisdom of Shinji. To come to hear the Dharma rarely met with is again, among all things, most difficult. To realize Shinji in oneself and to guide others to Shinji is among difficult things yet even more difficult. To awaken beings everywhere to great compassion is to truly respond in gratitude to the Buddha's benevolence. Namamilis. <laughs>